Hey, and welcome to Access to Perspectives Conversation again. Today we're here with Farah Hussain, who runs her own company as Farah Hussain Coaching and Training. Welcome very much, Farah. It's lovely to have you here. Hi, Joe. It's great to be here. Thanks for joining us. And everyone, today we talk about leadership and what leadership means for academics and how you can grow into a leadership position and what you can acquire as skills for yourself and your team as you if if you anticipate to have your own research group later on and first here as a as an expert with loads of experiences mostly but not exclusively from the corporate world from what i understand but Farah, please tell us about yourself how you got into leadership trainings and what leadership means to you generally. Like has the, the term, the definition of leadership changed for you over time? That's what I'd like to hear and share with our listeners. Sure, Joe. First of all, thank you so much for inviting me to be on this podcast. We've been talking about it for a long time, haven't we? And we're finally doing it, which is really exciting. Indeed. So um, let me tell you a little bit about myself then. I've been working in corporate organizations and public sector organizations for the best part of 30 years. And I got into leadership. I, my first company was called Leadership Development Limited, where I was selling leadership courses, mm -hmm. can you believe? And I had amazing trainers who were leadership gurus um, traveling all over the world and selling those in those days they were on cds and they were on cassettes so they were selling their courses and my really? role was okay. yes i, had a, I um, remember the times but it's been a while. yeah I, I even bought some of those um they seem so archaic now so i got exposed to the training world of leadership um through some of the work that the um, people in, in this company did and as after I graduated, that was my first job. I didn't stay there for a huge, for a very long time, but I landed this amazing job and it was for a public sector organization. And I had the most amazing manager and he was my first manager. Um, and I didn't know anything really about leadership, no definitions, what it actually meant. All I knew was how I was being treated. And this manager, I was, um, so fresh out of uni, wanted to, you know, change the world. And this manager, he basically set a challenge for me where I had to train our chief execs and all the directors in within about four weeks time, in a very, very short space of time. He sent me on a training for trainers course. I was petrified you can imagine mm. never having done anything like that obviously we did small presentations at university but nothing of this level and it was um all on our policies and procedures um within that organization i went on to this course and said to him i don't think i'm ready i don't believe i can do this and he said yes you can and Looking back, especially with all the knowledge and experience that I've gained, I really believe that he was the best leader that I could ever have had. And one of the, the key qualities that stood out for him was that he believed in me. He challenged me, but in a very, very supportive way, mm -hmm. always having my back. And he also, he skilled me up mm -hmm. with the technical skills that I needed in order to deliver this course to very senior people. I felt I was out of my depth, but he was there metaphorically holding my hand. And when we were in meetings, he would always create a space to advocate for me, um, which, you know, these days we call that inclusive leadership, where we create opportunities for people to be their own spokesperson. Mm -hmm. We cultivate situations for people to be able to shine. And I just felt 
so, so supported, which really helped to build a lot of confidence so early on in my career. Now, I stayed with that organization for a few years. Um, and sadly, that experience of being managed in such a powerful and fantastic way was quite short lived. I had managers who, because I had such a fantastic um, gold standard experience, I was a able to compare and contrast. Mm. And other managers, I felt really fell short of the kind of qualities and traits that he had. Mm -hmm. um, and my journey was a journey which was, I would say, um, slow, but at the same time, I knew what I needed to do, but I didn't always have the training and support. I know from lots of corporate organizations, they don't necessarily put the kind of budget that's needed to really grow the leadership skills for people. So here I was, you know, having gained some fantastic positive experiences and some negative experiences and imbuing both the positive and negative and developing my role as a manager. As I went through my career working in private sector organizations, I was managing teams. And I have to say that my best lessons of becoming a better leader actually came from adversity and difficult situations where I believe that I failed. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll oh. give you an example. Um, one of my managers said to me, Farah, I need you to deliver a training session um, to, it was, it was our team and I was new to this team as well. Um, and I, in my head, if I had to break down what I was thinking, it was, I have to perform. It was, I have to know all the answers. I have to be better than everybody else. So I put so much pressure on myself and I was pumping myself up to be bigger than I actually was. And in the process of doing that, I was losing my true self. And he gave me some feedback and he said, Farah, you don't need to do this. You just need to be yourself. And that was, you know, I, I felt, embarrassed I felt humiliated the presentation didn't go that well um and here I was a manager of some of the people who were in the team um but that was such an important lesson to help me to just be my authentic self now that hasn't happened all the time but I practiced at it and I practiced on a conscious level which has really made the difference mm -hmm. um and part of that process is, and we, you know, hear about authentic leadership, and that is tapping in to accepting yourself and allowing yourself to be imperfectly perfect. How many times have we heard that before? <laughs> so yeah, Farah, authenticity. When I heard that before, like until a couple of years ago, I never knew what that really means. And when you said that you were told and then also eventually were able to embrace your authentic self as a leader. How did that turn out? And how, what, was, what were, was the transition from thinking, okay, this is how a leader should look and act like towards, okay, just being you and then still managing to lead and be respected in your position? It certainly wasn't an overnight thing at all, Joe. Um, and it was a work in progress. But one of the things that really stands out for me is that I was willing to make myself vulnerable, which means that I was willing to take risks. Um, and part of that is be prepared to lay myself bare, so to speak. And I'll give you an example of that. So when I was with my team members, I would actually say, We've got this project. It's a really tight deadline. At this moment in time, I'm not sure exactly what needs to be done. Now, before I would have thought, you know, what I have to say is go in with a plan that I believe is going to be right and then tell people that plan. 
But here I'm actually letting people know that I don't know all the answers. I don't have all the solution of how to get from A to B. And we're going to work on this together. So that was, it felt risky. But whenever I've done it, I've really felt that it's paid dividends. And what it's done is, I think it's made me just feel that I'm just more human. And when I do that, it kind of gives people permission also to make errors or mistakes because, you know, we're human beings at the, at the end of the day, we're not robots. So naturally we're going to slip up, there's going to be blips. And part of that process of me moving towards becoming more and more authentic is being prepared um, to take those risks and to be really open and honest um, and, and just communicate that in a, a really upfront way with my team members. Um, and then it just makes everybody almost feel more relaxed. So, hey, let's work on this together. Um, and then I feel relaxed as well. But it really has to start with the leader, the leader to be prepared to take the risk, to be take the first step and to be accepting of the fact that things, you know, don't come out perfect and shiny and new um, with all straight edges. There's going to be bumps along the way. So, yeah, it was, um, as I was saying, it wasn't an overnight process, Joe, at all. It was something that was a work in progress. But what I did do, I did this consistently. And the more consistently I did it, the more natural it began to feel that I could say, you know, hi, guys, you know, we're at our meeting. We've got X percentage of... Um, targets to to reach by this by the end of the quarter I've got some idea I'm open to ideas from yourselves let's work on this together mm. so I would open it up to the floor so this really ties in with the definition and um, I mean there's so many different definitions out there and I'm it's, it's not a definition that I hold on to or I've written it out but the words that come to my mind Joe, around what a really great leader is or what leadership let's start off with what leadership is it's about being able to influence other people in a way that enables them to continuously learn and grow and when I think of that I'm somebody who has arrived and not even arrived because I'm constantly on this journey I'm constantly learning and being open to growth it's only in that that place of learning and growth do I and reflection do I start improving. So the more I gain knowledge and I'm able to reflect and integrate that, I'm then able to improve. So if I can do that as a leader to influence others to learn and grow, then that's going to impact on performance. It's going to impact on relationships. It's going to impact on team morale. It's going to impact on productivity. Um, so I think all we, measurable, yeah. actually. Sorry, to interrupt, but these are all measurable indices. Like, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think one of the where leadership is expected to head towards, but. Um, it's, it's funny that it, well, it's not funny that you said that, but now that you said it, I remember like the the people that I respected most are those that were most approachable. And as you said, admitted that they don't know everything is also in in speeches, like in when researchers said instead of claiming, oh, we we've done so much research, which many most actually did, but then and then we found this and this, and then pretending as if um. They knew everything about the topic. But what's not only charming, but also honest and humble and also a matter of research integrity is when scientists then say, well, we, well, there's there's so many other questions and we didn't do this experiment because, well, ABC. And here are a lot of things that we're still not sure about. 
and even if the result that we see is um, like we can't be 100% sure. But that's also research. But let me not divert to, to another. So this is basically an honesty, approachability, um, but also back to leadership when, yeah, when also the superior person, so to say, admits that he and she doesn't know everything, doesn't have all the answers, that's when I felt most safe. And you said relaxed because then we can tackle the challenge as a team and as collaborators and in a cooperative manner rather than sure. executing demands. I think what I've found is that it actually builds uh, trust between mm -hmm. myself and my team members. And that's one of the biggest gifts that you can have, um, which really bonds you and uh, um, enables um, cooperation and collaboration to take place. But, you know, it, it's something that I've had to work on because that, um, you know, my self-esteem was really low and um, I had to do a lot of work on myself. So in order for me to be able to come to that stage where I continually remain authentic, I've got to keep working on myself because sometimes, you know, certain situations can pull me back. So I, I want to be really true to myself and true to my team and keep showing up for them um, because I'm responsible for them as a leader as well. Mm. You know, they're just not my team members whilst they're responsible for themselves, but I'm also responsible for them. I'll have their back just like my first manager had my back. And I want people to feel that and experience that. And that just, for me, um, helps the trust build. But one of the key things is that, and I've done a lot of work, and I know that you can relate to this, Joe, is... Um, learn about myself because when you learn about yourself that's when you grow and in order to lead others you need to first of all all know about yourself and so I've done you know a fair bit of work on myself learning you know the strengths are easy we all like to hear lovely things about you know what we're good at mm. But the, the weaknesses or the areas which require development can feel a bit cringy and make us feel a bit embarrassed. Um, but I confronted those sometimes through psychometric um, uh, tools. You, there is the famous one, the Insights um, personality tool, which is based on um, different color energies. Or you get the Myers-Briggs as well. And there's the disc and lots of other types of tools that measure personality, mm -hmm. which highlight not only the strengths, but also the weaknesses and also the blind spots and being confronted, whether it's in the form of a, a re report of, you know, what my blind spots are and also sharing them with the rest of my team, which is what I've done. I shared my reports openly and sat down on a one to one with my team members so I had their reports, they had my reports. And so we really kind of laid ourselves bare in terms of our personality preferences. And we were able to ask questions on what we could do in order to work better together, knowing that we may have yeah. uh, a predisposition towards um, making decisions in a particular way or communicating in a particular way. And that was so, so good. Um, but it wasn't easy to do, I'll tell you. But uh, now that I'm over that, I would encourage everybody to do that. But it does feel very, very scary to kind of, you know, open yourself up to your team members. And um, oh, I came across something really interesting. And this was by um, um, one of the leadership, um, prolific leadership uh, authors, um, John Maxwell. Um, he um shared a, an example of somebody coming onto one of his courses and saying I don't really think that you should share your weaknesses with your team and he was challenging um John Maxwell on this mm -hmm. and then John Maxwell said your team already know your weaknesses <laughs> yeah. and I thought that was amazing uh -huh. and he said the key is the team need to know that you know your weaknesses yeah, that's and that's where the power lies 
Yeah, that's the good I thought that but... in the in the hallway in the by the coffee machine usually like team the, the team will talk about the weaknesses for sure because that's also a, a way to win, that's a way to cope with bad leadership. And it's not helpful for the team spirit at all or for the productivity. No. Yeah, but when the leader knows their own weaknesses and says, look, hey, you know, my hands are up. I, I need to improve on my timekeeping. I need to improve on my organization skills. I need to inc improve on X, Y, and Z. Then it, the, the team get inspired um, knowing that the leader wants to improve and to be good for them. Mm. And that's really, um, that's very powerful, I think. That's massive, yeah. It's interesting how they say, like, what I mean, also knowing the weaknesses not only of the team leader, but also every team member allows the team to compensate the weaknesses by delegating the task appropriately to everybody's kind of best performance and therefore um, ensure a success for the project. Yeah. And isn't that also how societies work at, a, at another level, like where we have professionals in different disciplines and different professions um, being responsible for certain tasks which they are good at? So this is, I think it's a natural law in a sense. I, I, I tend to agree with that, Joe. Um, I think there's a lot to be said for strengths based um, jobs mm. so people are actually working to their strengths but at the same time having the ability to be able to adapt to do other areas of work which might require different skills it might require um, a, a greater amount of effort so sometimes you might need people in the team to do other areas of work because you know people are short-staffed so people need to have that ability to be able to adapt, um, adapt and be flexible. But at the same time, people's strengths are recognized so that the team can actually excel um, mm. because, you know, people within the team are working to their strengths. Yeah. But I'm also asking people, my team, some like, or constantly encourage and remind them of is like, like, once they usually start off with a certain set of tasks, which is just those that need to get done, those they sign up for. But I always encourage them also to think further, to see, look around what else is needed to be done in the organization to see what they would like to learn and where they would like to test their skills or improve their skills. Um, I think that's, it's, it's just, that's also, I think I read this somewhere and I felt like, yeah, that makes sense. And I think I'm already doing that to, to some degree, um, where leadership is about bringing up more leaders, like empowering the team members to be the next generation or this generation of leaders and not to, well, maybe also to take our seats eventually, <laughs> because that's what many state leaders are really bad at but eventually we'll have to free our seat and somebody else needs to be fit for the job or fit enough to grow into the job rather soon so in that sense it's, it's, like you said it's about empowering people to be their best self and i used to run talent development programs and one of the things that i would always say to the managers is that you you have to identify managers in your team who are going to be your successors. Mm. And, you know, if every manager was doing that at every tier, then what we're doing is we're building up not only a pipeline, but a succession pool of people to be um, successful and to, to move to higher positions. Um, but, you know, that, that can make people feel vulnerable, but mm. provided an organization is providing them with the right skill set, the right climate, and the right environment for those leadership skills to be um, harnessed and, um, and and to grow in the right environment, I think is is really key. Yeah, I agree. Um, I would like to go back to what you said in the beginning, like not to well, yeah. Um, when you mentioned that you were given space um, by your team leader at the time, how do you create space for others to, like, what are the, like, what's a, 
an example from maybe a board meet meeting where you have a junior staff member and then how do you give them the stage to make them feel they have yeah they have power for the moment and also to grow into their like, self i think preparation and planning is is key i mean people know when board meetings are coming up um and mentoring team members in preparation so that they've got the right information at their fingertips as well and i've experienced not leaders aren't always um comfortable in sharing information but sometimes it may mean a loss of status or the status will need to be shared um somehow that, that their position will be at risk um, and I think it's, you know, so, so important for leaders to create opportunities for people to have, um, obviously some information is going to be confidential, but to share as much information and to create um, time for people to be able to absorb that information in preparation for a meeting as well. Um, and part of the, you know, creating space actually requires um, managing the environment as well and part of that is sitting in a way that doesn't block off that team member mm. um, and physically moving the chair away so that the team member um, can adopt um, a spotlight mm. so that it, that spotlight is not being shared by myself so I would, you know, the chair was on wheels and I would often mm -hmm. wheel myself back to give them that that actual arena. So mm -hmm. the attention was on them. But I would um, spend time priming them, letting them know the kinds of challenging questions that could come up. I would always, always encourage my team members to say never, ever leave a meeting without asking a question. And I would share the information that I would be um, sharing with the rest of the the, the, the team um, or the board and um, and ask them where do you think you might be able to contribute based upon the work that you've been doing what could be so coaching them asking them powerful questions like what could be something of relevance that they could contribute that could have an impact and move the meeting forward based upon the subject matter so creating opportunities for them to start thinking about how they can participate in a meaningful way, what they could contribute, um, what questions they might be prepared to ask, but also physically creating that space. Um, and also when somebody is asking me the question is deferring to my colleague and to my team member. And I would physically say, well, um, I'd like to pass on to Joe, because I know Joe's been working on this far longer than I have. So over to you, Joe. And, you know, I know that my manager did that for me and it just makes you feel, oh my gosh, yeah. this is so amazing, so empowered, so cared for. And I think this is one of the key things that for me, I really believe that, leadership is about compassion it's about truly caring for people and that care comes across in our tonality it comes across in our gestures in our body language in the choice of words that we use and that helps us to be more authentic and more human as well joe mm. and one of the things that i would invite people to do and on my training courses whenever I've done leadership training courses is to say get to know your people get to know them where they are at and where they want to get to and when I say get to know them was where they are at that's about finding out about who they are as people not just as somebody who is you know the um the IT person or not somebody who's the HR manager, but somebody who's got a family, who's got relationships, who's got a dog, who's got a story, find out about them on the human level. Mm. And, um, and, and remember important pieces of information that they share with you that you can then um, relate to so that you know, you're, you're building that relationship with, with your team member. 
Uh, it really goes a long way. But to do that on a consistent basis, create um, finding out about people, but also finding out about people in such a way that shows that you actually value them. Talk about something that they value. Talk about, uh, do something that um, they value. You know, whether it is somebody needs to go home early to pick up their child mm -hmm. and, you know, um, or the fact that somebody has got a, um, um, a celebration in their family or that somebody's family member is ill and they need to go and visit them on the hospital, even before they ask you, let them know that, you know, it's okay if they need to take a bit of time um, off to do that, yeah. they can make it up at another time. So all those kinds of little things go such a long way to show that you genuinely care about your people. And then, you know, we've all heard about the law of reciprocity. People cannot help themselves, but want to do something nice or good for you. Mm. It, it, at a very, very basic level, it's a bit like, you know, some of your listeners may be drivers, but when we're driving down um, um, a road and we want to join a main road, we're always trying to catch the eye of the, of the driver who's approaching to allow us to allow them to let us in uh -huh. and then what tends to happen because they've let us in as we're driving along we're then approaching a driver who wants to come in it softens us it makes us much more compassionate towards that other driver and then we allow that driver to come in it's a very very small example but to me it's a very powerful one mm. and that has a ripple effect in terms of the team and in the organization as well but it has to start from the leader because the leader can act as the role model but part of being the role model is saying look I'm here learning just as much as you are you know but what I'm going to learn I'm going to make sure that it sticks so I can be the best for you guys and um and just say that from the position of like, you know, I, I'm not all, all, I'm not all together there yet on this, but hey, I'm open to learn from you. Wow, that was beautiful to listen to, and I, I would love to work in your team. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, we, we, we agreed already that we're gonna make turn this into a series of podcasts, so I think we can just cut it here for now there's so much information and advice and coaching and yeah like so much stuff in in just this episode alone and there's more to come and also as always um so if you're not listening to this so you will find for us details in the show notes and the affiliate blog post so people can also contact you directly, isn't it? If sure, yes. We provide coaching and training on leadership and on team building um, and successful performance, both at a senior level and across the organization. And you've also worked with researchers who are who might sometimes think they're a particular kind of people, but we're also just humans at the end of the day. But I think you know. Researchers are probably, I would say, no different from um, a lot of middle managers that I've seen. Um, middle managers who are very um, proficient, highly competent technically in their roles get promoted into senior management positions. But very rarely do organizations provide them with the kind of training support and coaching um, development that they need to, to support their team. So you can end up with managers wanting to micromanage because they know what needs to be done, but they don't know how to inspire mm. others uh, and lead others to be able to be really effective um, because they've never really been trained. And also, they're not really doing what they love sometimes as well, because their love, particularly as researchers, is in the research project, is really getting down into the detail. That's where their passion lies. And they can find themselves either thrusted into a senior role in a professorship role or leading a team of people without having the skill set and I would say the mindset to be able to lead the team um, 
effectively. And rather than doing what they really love, which is their passion, they're now having to put in um, funding proposals and get involved in, you know, all the administrative um, things which take a lot of time. And so they can feel completely exhausted by and overwhelmed by the task ahead of them. And I think, you know, just as I needed help badly because I would just revert back to type, um, we can all be in a situation where we all need a little bit of a helping hand. Excellent. Yeah, I think you're very much um, perfectly summarized what I've observed and also found um, as challenges in people I graduated with who then went on the academic um, career to lead their own research teams. Um, but let's talk more about the how tos and I'm sure there's also a set of tools that you probably can recommend um, what people can rely on, on established tools and procedures and workflows to, to become our best self as a leader or person in a leadership position. Um, and today's topic was for the most part about empathy, compassion for our team, which I would say is another mindset to some extent, which I would think is the foundation for anything technical that follows. Do you agree with that? I, I would. I mean, I didn't use the word empathy, but you captured it for me in, in fairness, Joe in care, um, compassion towards your fellow team members, um, builds trust um, and helps you to influence relationships to help people learn and grow so that they can perform to the level that's required by them and their organizations. Um, and it requires the humility, the open heartedness, mm -hmm. and also the desire to be um, to to learn about oneself, to become aware. Because the more aware we become of ourselves, reflect on it, then we're able to integrate that new learning into improving ourselves. Mm -hmm. And you know, we're we're on the the journey to being a successful leader. Um, you know, and leadership comes in in all. Um, shapes and forms but I'm sure we, we can pick that up in the future series that we're going to be talking about yeah let's do that thanks for today Farah welcome back no, it's all my pleasure thank you for asking me Joe. we finally did it finally it's been on the pipeline for some time but yeah lucky listeners here is your show on leadership um so yeah and be back for more <laughs>